You're listening to Kayak Flyer with your host, Sean. Tonight, we're brought to you by Tennessee Trailers, OutdoorAdventureTrailers.com. Simply the best way to get your kayak to and from the water. Bajuco Flats Flyco. Simply the best custom-made fly rods on the market. Always built to order just the way you want it. Find Bajuco Flats Flyco on Instagram and Facebook. Stoneflynets.com, made 100% in the great state of Arkansas with your choice of woods or burls. Stonefly Nets can even be customized for that favorite fisher person in your life. Check out Stoneflynets.com for details. Cutthroatfurledleaders.com, the only leaders that I fish with. Cutthroat furled leaders are excellent for saltwater, freshwater, trout, bass, you name it, you can catch it with a Cutthroat Furled Leader. Head to Cutthroatfurledleaders.com, promo code kayak to save 15%. Guys, I want to thank you for being with us tonight. Adam had some technical difficulty. I really want to give a shout out because Adam brings so much to the show. Head over to Latrell's Fly Shop on Instagram and on Etsy. He makes custom flies. He ties custom flies. And trust me, they're great flies because he even charges me when I give him free stuff. So head over and check out Adam's store and, uh, we're going to have a fundraiser to get him a better computer and a better internet connection. I think that's the only thing we can we can do at this point in time. Um, but I know Adam has this problem, and I have this problem, and you probably have this problem if you're a fly tire, and that is keeping everything organized. My, I see on Facebook, on Stupid Simple, and a lot of these pages, they're like, hey, post your tying station. And all these guys have these really neat things. And I'm sitting here going, I've got a pile of materials. I've got eight pairs of scissors because I can never find one pair of scissors in my mess. And tonight we've got Rick with Oasis fly benches, fly tying benches. And he can solve that problem for us. And not only is he a good guy, he's also a great friend of the mad scientist who you know I love from Fly Tires Dungeon. So we got to give some some love to Fly Tires Dungeon for getting Rick on the show with us. Rick, how you doing, buddy? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's it's my pleasure, honestly, because I've been looking at your stuff and you are like the king of organization when it comes to fly tying. I, I lose my stuff constantly. I know Adam does too. It's like you get in a zone and you put something down. It's like, where did that go? And yeah. you've got a wide variety of stuff and you've been doing this for a long time. Over 30 years. Yep. Started in the, uh, I built my first bench for me in the mid late eighties called, I it's called the lap bench. And it was a pretty wide bench. And I would sit on my lazy boy chair while I was watching TV and tie flies. It was big enough where you could, t- not so big, you couldn't just take it off when the doorbell rang or something and set it aside. Um, and then um, I gave, I built a second one for a friend of mine for his birthday. Uh, and then the following year, I donated one to our local uh, Trout Unlimited club in Tucson uh, called the OPTU, Old Pueblo uh, Trout Unlimited. And at the, the banquet, you know, they were raffling off rods, reels, artwork and there'd be two or three people's hands would go up every time an item would go up and they saved the bench for last and when they brought the bench out there were like 12 hands went up and i go whoa you know i mean it was not it was nice looking at you know i I was very proud of it and it went for like 200 bucks this was 35 years ago and i remember turning to a friend of mine saying you know I, i might have something here and so that kind of started me thinking and i started making some of those lap benches, selling them through our local called Dry Creek Outfitters. At the time. They're still in business in Tucson and doing just on consignment at first. And that was about the time I started taking my summers off. And I was a teacher back then. And I would, uh, I traveled, got a motor home and started traveling the West um, for three summers. And every summer, including the first one, I would always go through Yellowstone. And I did that for three summers. And after three years, I thought, you know, I don't need to go anywhere else. Yellowstone's got everything I want. So I started just parking at at Yellowstone for the whole summer. Started working at uh, Madison River Outfitters the first two years. Worked at Blue Ribbon Flies for four years. And my seventh summer up there, I just fished. And then after that, um, I got out of teaching. I I needed my summers to build inventory. 
and that was the end of my fishing career. <laughs> so <sweet. laughs> I just now I just work all the time. You know, I just uh, seven days a week. I just um, and kind of, kind of we'll go back, but kind of skip forward. In 2005, I started another business along with my benches because the benches were a good income in the Christmas and winter tying season. But come spring, when people are out fishing, they're not tying as much. So my sales would always drop off drastically. And um, I think, you know, okay, how can I make money? And I, I got into, I started a business up for rainwater harvesting in 2005. By 2008, I was so busy with these two businesses. They were both very full-time businesses. I said, something's got to change. So I called Bass Pro Shop, Orvis, and Cabela's and said, I can't sell you anymore. I've got this other business I really want to focus in on. I think that's my future. But I couldn't walk away from the benches because they were my baby I started, you know, back in the late 80s. And, uh, and, and there was a desire. There was a need out there. People really liked the benches. So I wasn't just going to walk away from it. So I, I've kept the two businesses. I just, I'm just so busy. Um, I'm 68 now, looking at retiring here in a few years. And um, I'll, something's going to slow down here in a couple of years. But um, I, anyway, I'm just busy. But going back to the beginning about the bench designs, you know, I, I would look at benches back in those days, and uh, they were pretty crudely made that were sold in fly shops, the ones I had seen. Uh, corners that didn't meet together, you know, not really good workmanship, craftsmanship. And and some of the designs I saw really bothered me, especially what you'll see in a lot of those fly tying benches. All your tool storage is at the back of the bench. Who wants to reach th two, three feet away to put their scissors away, you know, when they're done using them? Mm -hmm. So that was the big thing you'll see I came up with my bench designs. There's stuff right up in front where you, you're moving a few inches to put your scissors or your bodkin or your bobbin down. Um, and and then, um, oh, it's another thing. So this lap bench design I had, I, I built those for, it's the only design I had in my first few years. And I almost kind of got bored doing the same thing over and over and over. Then I decided, okay, let me come up with another design. So I came up with what, what I call the compact bench, which I still make to this day. Uh, and it's a really unique, different design and then I made a walnut version of it to, so that it wouldn't just be all oak. It would be oak and, and walnut. And those, I've, I've sold thousands, thousands of that design uh, through the years. And then, um, so it's it's uh, been been a progress. Uh, you know, when you go into a, making a business and you've got to depend on sales and somebody has one a really big bench, they want a small bench, you, you've got to offer a wide variety of styles. So I think I'm up to about, I've got about 12 different benches I make. And um, after a while, a while, I got thinking, okay, what else could I do? Oh, or accessories. You know, yep. what are you guys going to do with their hooks and their chenilles and their, their flashaboo and their beads and eyes? And um, so I started making accessory items, which have been very, very popular. My thread rack, which holds 120 spools of thread. My Sparkle Spinner 16 are probably my best two accessories. I make a thing called the hook hotel that holds holds a hundred different hooks using the Pro 20 hook classic hook boxes that I got from Spirit River back in the day before they were now I'm getting them through hairline. Same right. same thing. Um so but I made a wood case to hold five of those boxes that looks really nice. Yeah. Um, you know and I don't know what it is about teachers. I'm a teacher too. I mean we, we work all summer in a really hard job and then our hobby is just punishment as fly fishermen i mean we are gluttons for punishment and then we go and we tie on our free time in the winter we tie flies i mean that just screams i hate myself yeah. but your your benches and i've been looking at them because i was uh i acquired i guess i should say this i acquired a rather large piece of granite and through the power of the internet, I met a guy and uh, he is getting me, uh, his dad owns a metal lathe and he's getting me a, uh, a pedestal. Uh, well, I guess it'd be the bottom end of a pedestal so I can epoxy it to this granite. And I'm looking at your uh, benches. I can put my granite inside one of yours and tie it, or I could buy one 
that I can drop my vice in and it hooks up and I don't need to have anything extra. And that uh, the ability to change things out and even your standalone organizers, those will make a world of difference when you're tying. And I may be the oddball here. I have a bunch of friends who fly fish, but I'm the only one who ties. So I am cranking out guide flies, you know, I think this winter I'm up to something like 360 flies that I've tied Mm -hmm. and that's tying for like an hour and a half a night. And then like maybe four hours on a snowy Saturday. And I mean, I'm, I'm cranking them out, but I've always found that I put my stuff down and then I put something else down. Then I'm like, where did those scissors go? Yeah. And, you know, the organization is, is key when it comes to fly tying. Have you noticed since you've been doing this feedback about how people get more productive or how they feel better or how their wife isn't upset with them for the mess they make? I, almost every bench I send out, I always get an email back. Oh, it's fantastic. Beautiful work. Love it. And my wife will be so much happier, you know. And, you know, with the with the bench idea, some a few of us, a few lucky people have a designated room where they yeah. can have their flight time materials but and do their flight time. But a lot of people, they don't. So with, with a bench, it's about a portable bench. You can sit in the living room at the dining room table, you know, be a part of the family, tie flies while you're socializing with the family, get that done and seem to be, instead of being um, banished to the back room where yeah. you're tying. So like my premium fl- benches all have felt bottoms. So you can put them on the nicest dining room table out there. You don't have to worry about scratching the table. And then when you're done tying it, you're halfway through a fly. You say, oh, I've had enough for the night. You pick the whole thing up, store it in the back room. And then a couple of days later, you pick it up, put it down, and you start right where you left off. All your, your tools, materials, they're all right where you want them. Um, and and you're ready to go. It, you know, People, yes, you could work out of a shoe box. You can set up, set up and tear down every time you go to tie but having a bench, it just makes it so much more convenient and, and, and handy to do the hobby. That's exactly where I'm at. I've got a basement. Um, it's my basement. I have, my, I have nothing that I, none of my dead animals are on the wall upstairs. They're all down here in my man cave. I've got my TV, but I don't always want to sit down here. And the only heat I have down here um, is a wood stove. So if I'm going to come down and tie for, let's say an hour, it's not worth firing up the wood stove for. Yeah. Yeah. And so in the winter time to be able to spend time with the family, I'll take my, some of my stuff upstairs. And my wife is just, woo. I mean, she's not mean about it, but she's like, are you going to pick some of this up? (laughs) And I'm like, well, I'm using a lot of it right now, but I understand and a lot of guys aren't lucky enough to have that dedicated room. I mean, I've, I've got my organizers down here. I just take up what I need to take up for the flies. I'm lucky enough to have kids that are still at home so I can tell them to run down and grab me something so I don't have to go up and down the stairs. Yeah. But that's not the case for a lot of people. And if you need a different color thread, you know, having it right there on the bench is great. Yeah. And that's another thing about thread. Like, how many times have you gone... Oh, I think I need some of the, you're at the fly shop. I, I don't have any black, like, dot thread. Let me, I better go buy some. Uh, so then you get back home and you say, oh, God, I've already got four spools of it. You know, because <laughs> you don't, you're not organized. You don't know where everything is. You know, yeah. So it, it keeps you from spending money you don't need to spend. And I, we talked, you know, the other day when we were talking about when I got into fly tying, you know, I, I first learned in high school. And then I got real serious when I moved to Steamboat Springs and I taught there for high school for four years and I got into skiing and just a beautiful place to live in the summer and a lot of fishing. They had a real good fly shop there. Um, and I took my first fly tying classes there and that's when I got real serious about tying flies. Um, but, uh, and then it's just gotten worse, worse and worse. When I worked at Blue Ribbon, uh, all my money went to buy <laughs> materials, but, uh, I, I, I think when I was in my thirties or late early forties, I think I figured out one time I'd spent up over forty thousand dollars on flight time stuff, you know. And and I don't, I just, I, I just could not kind of keep track. 
I'd go to Bob Marriott's and drop a thousand dollars on flight time material, you know, back in the day. Um, so it was, it's a hobby that just t- took over my life. And my, other, fun. I love it. Yeah. my other hobby is brewing beer. And so I know a lot of duck hunters that like homebrew beer so mm-hmm. I can get feathers. <laughs> gotcha. You know, it's, it, it's becoming a, a trade at this point in time where you know, it's like, what, oh, you when, duck hunt? <laughs> one time I was coming back from Southern California on the desert and I was, I was driving the road and I stopped because uh, there was this beautiful bird and hit by a car. It was a, 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 a game of prey, like a foul, you know, a, a, a hawk of some kind. Right. Beautiful feathers, barred, soft, beautiful barred feathers. I stopped the car, got out, got a plastic bag, threw it in the bag, threw it back in my car, and I kept driving. I stopped in in uh, Blythe to get at McDonald's to get a hamburger, and a friend of mine walked up to me and said, "Hey, I saw you back there picking up that dead bird on the road." <laughs> and, but that bird stayed in that bag for years. I never because you can't use those feathers. It's no, crazy. yeah. So eventually I just threw it away, you know, but yeah. I didn't want to get caught using the feathers, but beautiful. We do crazy things sometimes. Oh, I've got a guy that I know he pheasant hunts every year and he loves homebrew beer. And I'm like, dude, I'll trade you a case of beer for your pheasants. And he's like, okay. Yeah. And so we meet up once a year and I trade him 24 homebrew bottles and uh-huh. I get, I think the last time I got five and uh-huh. I'm like, dude, I'll give you some beer, but I don't need any more pheasant yeah. right now. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I, I'm not a hunter. Uh, never got into guns. Uh, a lot of my friends are, and, and I can get birds from time to time, but uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's great. I mean, I know duck hunters. I, I don't duck hunt. Um, I, I always say I'm allergic to the cold. I don't like it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, if I could move to Grand Isle, Louisiana, I would go in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. Um, I can deal with the hot temperatures, just not the cold temperatures. Mm-hmm. And you know, I I know these guys that'll get up at two o'clock in the morning and go draw for a spot the duck hunt. And I'm like, hey, if you happen to get one of these, yeah, come by the house yeah. and I'll clean it for you and I'll take care of it. And you know, and. I'm not opposed to cleaning game. It doesn't bother me, but it's like, I'll clean whatever ducks you've got if I can have this one. Well, you and know, it works out. Speaking about birds, where I live in the Sierra Vista, Arizona, it's down the southeast corner. I'm not too far from Tombstone and Bisbee. Um, we have the San Pedro River that runs through our valley. And that was the river that Cortez, when he first came in up into what is now the United States, he came up through our valley in the I don't know, 1400s or something. Yeah, long time ago. Our our area is considered uh, a birder's paradise. It is one yeah. of the premier places if you're a birder, especially hummingbirds. We can get uh, 14 species of hummingbirds coming through here in the season, because we're so close to Mexico. We get some birds like the um, the uh, elegant trogon, which is a Mexican bird, but, but it's its area comes up into southern Arizona. It's a, it's a green, it looks like Christmas. It's green, red, and white. And big blotches. It's a like a like kind of like a parrot kind of bird. And they have a very unique um, uh, 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 call they do. And I got into birding for about a year, about five, six years ago. And I, oh, this is great, but I, I can't do this. Maybe when I retire someday. But <laughs> the, the birders down here are just, are just, so hardcore at what they're doing. And th- this is the place to be if you're into birding when you have yeah. the idea of birds. So. And, you know, just the, the, uh, the amount of, of feathers and fur that, you know, there are the varieties that you can use to tie flies, mm-hmm. I think is absolutely amazing. Um, I was looking at something the other day and this guy goes, I scored this and it was polar bear fur. Yeah. from like the 1930s and i'm yeah. like people i've, got a, bag, I've got a bag of that yeah a small bag ziploc bag yeah it's it's wild it's absolutely wild and you are a big conservationist oh, so yeah. you're working you're working with your local trout unlimited in the state to reestablish some fish can you tell us a little bit about that 
Yeah, when I was in my um, 30s and I was living in Tucson, teaching there in Tucson, I got very involved in that OPTU club, TU club in Tucson. And they were working current at that time on the West Fork of the Black River up in the, our White Mountains. Beautiful. You wouldn't know you're in Arizona. You'd think you're in Colorado or Montana. It's a really pretty area up there. Um, and they want, were trying to bring back the Apache trout, which is an endangered species at the time. And it's indigenous to our area. The Apache and the Gila trout are only found here in, in Arizona and New Mexico. And so I, I was doing a lot of projects back with them, uh, doing fish barriers to keep uh, non-native species from going upstream into these, these little tiny streams, uh, especially the brown trouts, brook trouts, the rainbows. And then they would uh, clean out that stream and stock it with uh, Apaches. And with their work that they did back in the, this was in the, um, in the er, late 80s, in the early 90s, the Apache trout was taken off the endangered species list and is now on the just the threatened list. They have about 25 um, uh, watersheds now where they have been uh, stocked and uh, where they can breed and, and live. Uh, but they they were at the time they figured thousands and thousands of years ago those fish could go downstream and and stock uh, you know inhabit other streams through the Gila River, which is uh, eventually dumps into the um, the Colorado River down near in Mexico down in Mexico. Um, I since I moved here in 1990 in Sierra Vista and I taught here for eight years. Um, uh, we've had a fly fishing club it's, it's, um, and a good bunch of guys. And uh, we are working on a project currently. In fact, tomorrow we're going over to the Chiricahua Mountains. It's about an hour and a half drive from here. And we're scoping out a little creek called East Turkey Creek. Um, one of the guys is going to hike the entire two mile length from the head where the spring is down to where it crosses the road. The Arizona Game and Fish is interested on this stream, stocking it with uh, Gila trout. Um, this very next stream over, which is the North Fork of Cave Creek, there are little rainbows up in there currently that are able, that were stocked in there decades ago, and they're still in there. So they are going to get rid of those rainbows and put Gila trout in that stream also. And the South Fork of Cave Creek is another stream they want to look at as potential. We brought Gila trout for the first time. I was myself and John Marvin and uh, Paul Hoyt and one other person in our club, we went over to a little a pond, uh, a little lake on the backside of uh, the, the Mount Graham, where the town Thatcher and Thatcher and um, the t Safford are located. And there's a little lake up there called the Fry Mesa Reservoir. It has a very s small, it's um. I don't think it's bigger than an acre, but it's deep. It has a really deep, maybe two acres. But um, the Fry Creek runs into that dam over a big waterfall, goes into that lake. And they brought some Gila trout for the very first time from a fish hatchery in New Mexico and stocked it. We were there when they did it. Um, they also, we stocked the stream upstream, upstream from the lake where we had to hike up and they would helicopter in some 55 gallon drums of Gila trout. Uh, one, I went to the, lucky I pulled the good straw. I was at the lower one, but the younger kids, they went up to the higher one and they all had a five gallon bucket. We filled it with stream water and they put, oh, half a dozen, a dozen Gila's in our bucket. We had to go find a place to put it in the stream. And uh, so that was a pretty neat feeling. And, and then we hiked back down to the lake and the truck just dumped. Gila trout in there out of its chute in the back. And these guys, they were fish over 20 inches that yep. they were putting in there. And John was the very first, my friend John was the very first one who hooked a Gila trout in the state of Arizona that nice. day. So we got a picture of him doing that one. A year or two ago, <clears throat> we have bad fires here in the, in the summertime and they just decimate um, a, a watershed. And that watershed was hit. Um, but they were surprised that the trout made it through it. Um, there are still Gila trout in that creek. And they're starting to come back. On top of that same watershed, there were some, uh, I fished a little stream called Grant Creek on the top of Mount Graham 30 years ago and was catching six, seven inch Apache trout. And there's a lake up there at about 
8,000, 9,000, I think it's at 9,000 feet, where they stock trout in there. Um, Riggs Flat Lake is on top of Mount Graham. You can go up there and it's, it's 110 down in the valley and it's 70 degrees up at the lake. It's just amazing the elevation difference. If you want to get out of the heat, you can do it in the summer. But um, that, that, uh, that, we had a bad fire up there a couple years ago and Grant Creek just got wiped out. And there are, I don't think there's any fish in there anymore. It is, they were, there were boulders the size of school buses that had been moved because they were showing before and after pictures of that fishery. Um, and it's just beautiful little stream that's just a boulder field right now. Yeah. Is it when the fires come through? I mean, I, we don't, we do in Missouri, Missouri is very, we do controlled burns and we have burns and, and we have lightning strike burns. We don't have what you would call a, a wildfire like you guys are used to. Um, and we have, a, we, you know, we're pretty wet as far mm-hmm. as our climate. Our, work, when, our worst months are May and June. Yeah. It's the, the humidity level will be down to zero. You know, and it'll be a hundred degrees, one hundred and ten degrees. It's it just we wait. We wait for the monsoons to come in July, July, August, and September is when we get half of our yearly rainfall. Um, and that's where my other business comes in handy. So right. I'm really busy in the spring selling water tanks and getting people set up the rainwater harvesting systems in the spring for our monsoon seasons. But once the monsoons come, the fire danger greatly reduces. But we also have heavy winds in the spring. So we had a fire here at my house about eight years ago, and we were evacuated for a week. I stayed here at the house. I wouldn't leave because if I left, I couldn't come back. So I, I mowed, I raked, I cleaned, I organized, I packed my truck, my trailer. You know, I kept an eye on the fire that was burning this mountain range behind us, which is the Wachukas is right behind me up to 8,000 feet peaks. Um, my house is at 5,000 feet. So it's, um, it, and the, that last day we had 60 mile an hour winds and the, the fire was right upwind from me. And I was watching that wind coming towards the house. It, the, uh, the fire, it got within about three or 400 yards. I watched this, something blew up and with this 300 foot column of smoke up in the air. And he said, okay, I'm out of here. And I got off the roof. By the time I got off the roof, the wind had shifted to the northeast. And I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. And sure enough, within 20 minutes, it had passed me. So I escaped, escaped with the skin of my teeth on that. But that that's scary. I mean, you, you can't stop a fire with 60 mile an hour winds. No. It's just, it's just you just get out, got to get out of the way. Okay. So we were, we were they, they lost, uh, we had about, I think we lost about 50 people that year uh it, it, no no i'm sorry we did, we lost about 50 homes in the canyon just a couple of miles south of me that year i'm not sure if we had any uh deaths with that fire so when those fires come through i'm sure they the the water temperature obviously but is it because the vegetation is gone and they're May, I, I don't how does right. it how does it impact the stream is it the ash flowing down from when it rains and it deoxygenates the water is it that the water comes down there's nothing to stop it so the force moves those boulders how does that impact the fish well yeah the, the the flash flood definitely would impact the fish but also then you've gotten rid of all your cover so now the stream is right out in the sun and there's yeah. so it can't keep the water cool anymore so your right. water temperatures get up really high in the summer months. So the only way these fish can make like those rainbows up north fork of a Cave Creek have been able to make it through is because they're up at 8,000, 9,000 feet. And it's a little tiny stream and there's they haven't had any fires in a long time in that air, particular area. So the, the fish are still doing just fine. I have to say in a hundred and I don't know how many episodes, I mean, we've been doing this for quite a while. Um, and you know, nearly 30,000 downloads. This is the first time I've ever had anybody on the show that can talk about wildfires and the Impact effect, them, yeah. the effect. And this is, this is really neat. It's, it's a really good conversation. Before I forget about it, I, I, I want to tell you, your people are watching this to put up that link of that, that I was telling you about a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. We have Zach Beard. 
who is the native trout specialist for Arizona Game and Fish, uh, gave a Zoom meeting to our club. It was our first Zoom meeting we tried with the with the club. We've been we've been having board meetings all the time, but we haven't been meeting as a club. So I thought, well, let's try a, a Zoom meeting. And we had a, oh, a dozen people on the meeting, but he did a great presentation about their their pride, what they're working here in Arizona with the Gila trout and the Apache trout. He has great pictures and slides, go, <clears throat> goes over all the watersheds where they're working on, um, not just these Chiricahua mountains that we're just starting to look at, but things they've been working on for many years to bring these the, the Apache trout back from the brink of extinction, which they have done now. Uh, and the, the Gila trout is next on their list. So they're, we want to get them in some streams out here now. Because um, that, that time I told you where they stocked that lake, that was that probably six, eight years ago. That was the first time we had a Gila trout. And they figure that Gila trout mainly are found over in the Gila wilderness area in New Mexico. But they figure because the Gila River flows through here, those trout would have been up in our mountains also in the Arizona mountains. And the those videos Gila. those videos will be linked in both the YouTube and the episode description for the podcast. So, and then I will also put them on Kayak Flyer uh, on our Facebook page at Kayak Flyer. And I will, I don't know how to link on Insta- Instagram. Is weird, but I will definitely um, p- share something out on Instagram to find that. So when you're listening to this podcast, um, either way you're listening to it, go to the show notes. You can go to that video. Or if you're watching the show on YouTube, simply go down to the show notes look and we'll have all that in there so you can see it because this is an amazing and i mean you you and i were talking about before the show these are trout that people have never seen before if they don't live in your area right right they're native just to here and uh it's a great presentation zach did it's about 30 40 minute show um and of course also we were talking earlier you know there are some trouts down in mexico I even heard there are trout in some, there are some mountains in the Baja of Mexico, the, the peninsula, that are high enough elevation that have trout in them. That uh, Years ago, I heard there were trout in those, but I am just north of the um, the large mountain range, let me think of it, right, the Sierra Madres in Mexico. It's a huge mountain range. It's where you don't want to go fishing because we were talking earlier, you don't, there are these black SUVs parked all over the place with tented windows and you just don't want to meet these guys. So and that's where you'd have to go to find these fish. But I have a friend of mine here in town who his brother was governor of the state of Baja a number of years ago. So they have political connections in Mexico. And I was just talking to him the other day. Uh, what's the possibility of bringing, getting some yaki trout up here? It's another trout species that's in the mountains in Mexico. And he's going to do some phone calling, but I just called Zach today because I I wanted to talk to him before I came on this podcast. But Zach kind of says that that's kind of a no starter. You know, they they're not not really interested in bringing in another species of trout from Mexico into the United States um, with the Endangered Species Act and all that has to do with that. It's just it's something they don't want to get involved with. So we avoid politics on this show, but I think it's I don't think it's political to say that we can all agree some of the things that are going on with those black SUVs, that's really detrimental to the folks that live there and detrimental to society. But, you know, you think about what the honest men and women that aren't in those SUVs, what rewards they could be reaping from having tourists down there, just like, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. if you go to Patagonia, I mean, <clears throat> how many people go to Patagonia? I mean, that's a huge destination down there to trout fish and guides are making money hand over fist. And it's very sad that the economies down there have worked out the way they have, where that is the norm. And that's all I'm going to say about it, but it would be beautiful if we could somehow figure out a way to do that. Yeah, I was thinking, I was telling Zach, wouldn't that be great if, if people wouldn't fish for us, fish they've never fished for before? And the only place they could do it would be here in Arizona, if we could get yeah. some streams, but you know, they just you know, they don't want to get it. But we do have the Gila and Apache trout, which are pretty cool fish. There's there's a lake, um, 
called Christmas Tree Lake up in the White Mountains. It's uh, in, on the Indian Reservation, and it is a beautiful little lake. It's uh, They only allow 20 rods a day. They, they, I think it's a $25 a day fee, along with a $9 fishing license for the that's, Indian Reservation. That's not bad. And it's... <laughs> Ah, it, it is known for large Apache trout. I've yeah. caught 18, 20 inch Apaches up in there. They're they're a beautiful fish. They're not different than your rainbows, your browns. They they don't have the coloration that a rainbow or a brown does, but they're in their own rights. They are a very pretty fish. They have a kind of an olive side with lo- little speckles uh, all along their body uh, that get denser up towards the top. Um, and they're they're definitely in the trout species. And in fact, the Arizona Game of Fish, they have a, a native trout certificate you can get by catching each of their the native trout species here in the state, with the Apache being one of them. That's cool. And I know we we talk a lot about native fish and non-native fish. And I, excuse me, I hear rumors that some of the rivers the in Missouri and I know down in Arkansas they can, where they're coming out from the dam, where the waters are cold enough. But we're really looking at Rainbow um, and Brown and Missouri. They have cutties and brooks, um, and then they hybrid the uh, golden trout and the tiger trout down there um, in Arkansas. But Missouri has a deal where you catch, there's nine rivers and if you catch one fish in five, you get a bronze. Seven fish in seven, you get a silver. And nine and nine, you get a gold. And it's just one fish. It's honor system. It's, it's a great deal. But we also have these places that, and uh, one of my friends actually won the NCA bracket tournament at his work. And he, mm-hmm. he got like a couple hundred bucks. And he was like, let's drive up to this let's drive up to this trout farm and literally they have like their own little run and it's a beautiful little like European style four foot wide run. It's it's a gorgeous place, but they have fish in there, but they dump into the, to the river, the, their spring dumps into the river. So you can't put anything in there that Missouri department of conservation doesn't allow. But if you could find a way to put in some of these species that you're talking about, that yeah. people have not had that opportunity, that would just be gorgeous. What they got to watch out for is that they don't hybridize with other fish. Like the Gila right. trout they're going to put in the North Fork at Cave Creek, they've got to go up there and remove all the rainbows from there. And they'll go up another time or two, then shock, they'll walk the entire length of the river and with a shocking uh, electronic shocking that stuns the fish. They, unfortunately, they're just going to throw them on the bank. They just got to. There's, it's so remote you can't do anything with them back there. But they want to remove them out of the stream before they put the helas in. If they don't, they'll hybridize with helas, and then you lose your your pure strain of helas, which is they need. That's what the goal is. Why don't you talk to them and you and I just spend the summer out there and catch them all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, the, you better get your hiking shoes on. <laughs> Man, I'm is, fat. I don't hike. A rough country too. Where where we're going tomorrow? It's 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 really steep uh, terrain. You know, a little tiny creek going down through there. You mentioned something a little while ago that that, that sparked a spark in me when you said golden trout. Um, we years ago, uh, a group four of us went up to the Wind River Range on the east side, which is called the Indian side. That you have to go through the Indian Reservation to get access to the trail to hike nine miles to get up to 10,000 feet where the in, where the golden trout are. And we were catching goldens. I mean, when you you see these pictures, of these goldens in California that are eight, 10, nine inches long, we were catching 20 inch, 22 inch golden trout in these lakes. We caught one that was five pounds. It looked like a dinner plate. Yeah. And, and, um, but, but to get there, not only the nine mile hike to get up in there, but you've got to pay the Indians to cross their land. You have to buy a fishing license, an Indian fishing license, even though you're not going to fish on the Indian reservation, but right. you have fishing equipment with you in possession while you're crossing their land, you have to buy their, their license. And then you got a nine mile hike about, about a 3000 foot elevation gain. Uh, and we spent about a week up in there. It was just gorgeous. And we, uh, 
Mm -hmm. Talk about beautiful fish, man. Now I have to, I, in total, uh, you know, honesty, I live at like 300 feet. No. Oh, yeah. I'm in an oxygen rich environment. My, my fatness would not be able to make it on that hike. <laughs> well, that was, yeah. I had a 60 pound pack on me. We, we, this was 15 years ago. I, I couldn't do it now. I, I, we're trying to figure out there on the west side of the wind rivers. You can get, we did another one a few years later. We went up on horses. Uh, that was, but the fishing was nowhere near as good as it is on the east side because you just don't see anybody on the east side. It's it, you can hike in there without going to the Indian reservation, but it's a over a twenty mile hike if you come in from the north to get to those lakes, the Golden Trout Lakes, and and then they're uh, above Timberline. The upper ones above Timberline, the lower one where we camped was right at the, the Timberline. At, and you like, can't take horses that way. They, they we can't we don't know anybody that will take horses up to those lakes really? one of our members in our club goes up there almost every year up the wind rivers and and he always comes back with a, a show powerpoint presentation of his summer up in the wind rivers it's it's an amazing amazing uh fishery yeah i uh my grandfather got us a horse when i was a kid he got all the grand he got a horse and the grandkids all had access to it and my sister would ride this horse bareback. Yeah. I would go squirrel hunting in the woods, not even bothering this horse, and it would chase me down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like motorcycles a lot more than horses, but... That's the first and last time I've ever been on a horse, was that trip. And they said it was <laughs> going to be about a four-mile four mile ride to this, where we were going. It ended up being like eight miles. And our butts our, were so sore... One of the guys fell off his horse about 200 yards before the campsite. Said, I, I just can't do it anymore. I can't do it anymore. I can't get on the horse. I said, we're here. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, oh, it took us, it took you a day to recuperate from that ride. But those animals were amazing. I, I mean, I was in awe of what that horse was doing. Like, you know? like I said, my wife or my, uh, my sister can ride a horse. My, I don't think my wife's ever been on a horse. Um, and it's so funny because my daughter's like, you know, she's like, oh, I want to ride a horse and this and that. And I'm looking at her going, no, you want to ride a Harley Davidson. You don't want to ride a horse yeah. because anything that big with a mind of its own, you never know what it's going to do. And I just have to laugh at it. Um, having had a horse and they're a lot of work, but man, when it comes to going into that back country, there's nothing that'll beat them. You know, yeah. I mean, they're great for that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things. And, you know, living here in Missouri, we take a lot of things for granted. And, you know, you go down to Louisiana and there, you can take a lot of things for granted down there. You know, there's no mountains. I mean, we've got the Ozark mountains, but there, it's more of a valleys with normal elevation at the top. But out there, that's got to be really wild to be able to go up and find trout. And that's that's got to be a really rewarding experience for you guys. Yeah, these mountains right behind my house, they're up to 10,000 feet. You know, the the, uh, the Wachukas, they, the peaks are. So we'll get snow on them in the, in the summer. And I have a creek that runs right through my property. Um, if we get a good enough snowpack, it'll run. It'll start running in November. And it'll run through April or May. And I love walk, stepping out the door and hearing running water. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then it dries up in May and June. Then if we get some good monsoon starting in July, it, it can start running again in July. And it'll run until uh, September, October. Yeah. See, and I live where they built a ditch to get rid of the swamp. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so we fish for uh, ditch pickles and smallmouth bass around here. But back to, and, you know, just because we're, we're looking at the, at the, we got about 15 minutes left here. I want to go back to your benches and, and your, your ability to, to make these. And I want to talk a little bit about the quality of wood that you use when it comes to making these benches, because I, I've seen the walnut. I mean, you've got some really great, it's not I guess what I'm saying is you talked about the, the benches to begin with being like your lap bench. 
but you've evolved so much further to where they're very, very artistic. Now there, um, the lap bench, which I say I, I don't make anymore. It was a real pretty bench back in his day, but it was not a great organizer. It didn't really have a lot. And when I came out with my compact bench, all of a sudden it was a, you know, a much better organizer. And then another thing I should say is, uh, I don't know if you, do you know Dean Childs? Do you know of him? No, I don't know him. No. He, he started Wasatch fly tying tools. Okay. Yeah, you know, with the wood handles that they have the pretty wood handles. Him and I met years and years ago, so we kind of got got going, did a lot of work together. So I came up with my pro bench, which was designed for his tools because his handles are wider than the standard metal handled fly tying tools that most people had used from in the old days. Um, so I. I drilled my holes bigger for his tools and then also i had a the guy started a, a lighting company called giraffe lighting paul paul bergstrom i think was his name he eventually sold the company those lights were great lights the magnifying glass but they're you can't get them anymore they the company that bought him out are not making that lamp anymore but uh back to my benches primarily oak is my red oak is the main wood i use for most of my products, um, I like the highlighting of the walnut on certain benches, just because uh, the two tones of wood looks really good. And then uh, I, I took it a step further with my walnut compact bench, made about half of the bench out of walnut and half out of oak. When we did the um, the pro bench, though, I went a different direction because of the light by lasering artwork that's done on the base. The base is a piece of Baltic birch plywood and because it's very stable wood, very lightweight, and it's only a quarter inch thick. And we laser on the life cycle of the mayfly onto that, which really makes it a piece of art. And, yeah. and it was done by a group called the Fly Gals back when I was with Dean Childs, and he was putting that on a lot of his uh, fly tying boxes. He was selling to Orvis with that, that same artwork, and we've continued using it on the pro bench. Uh, I tried it one time on oak. It just didn't work because oak is too much of an open grain wood. Mm -hmm. You lost all the detail of the artwork. Um, so my pro benches, which I make in the, a C clamp version, I make it in two, actually th now three versions for pedestal vices. So I make one that has a five by eight recessed area for your pedestal vice. That does most all the rectangular shaped pedestal vices. I do a six by six area. When Peak and now Renzetti has come out with their pedestal base that is a six by six. So that will fit right in that recessed area in the front of the bench, making it a part of the bench. And just recently, um, uh, Renzetti, Renzetti came up with their streamer base, which is a six by eight inch base that is five pounds. So it's really designed for those guys who want to tie big flies. So now I had to come out. I've sold my first one here uh, for a, few, a month or so ago. My first pro bench with a five, a, a, five, a six by eight inch recessed area in the front. And yeah, the, and I'm looking oh, at. I'm, I'm I'm pulling up your website again because I can't remember the name of what it was that I just absolutely loved. There's another it, bench I came up called the Pedestal Partner. That one, there's no place to clamp a C-clamp vise on that pinch. It's designed for a guy who has a pedestal vise. So you're sitting at a table. The table is your work surface area. So you don't need a work surface area as you do with my other benches. Um, I would suggest uh, for it's either one thing I might say is all my benches, I make in left and right-handed versions. Right. So, I mean, why exclude those lefties out there? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I all of a sudden hear this, yeah, yeah, at least. So, um, and I probably, eh, probably 10% of the benches I sell are left-handed benches, you know, and, but they appreciate that. Um, but the, the pedestal partner is a really nice bench for a guy who has a pedestal vice, but it organizes your, your bottles, your tools, your threads. And so that really brings me to one of my key philosophies on fly tying and fly organization, fly tying organization. I don't think there is a box out there if you really get it seriously into fly tying, there's no container that's going to hold all your fly tying materials. Just give it up right now. You know, forget <laughs> it. 
but there there are things that you can do to organize your tools your threads and your bottles because those are finite items you're not going to have a thousand bottles or a thousand well you might have a thousand threads <laughs> but well, you won't have a thousand tools but you know so so a bench is designed to organize my your tools your bottles your threads yeah. and then material storage is something that what i do is tupperware containers yeah. and as as one tupperware container gets jam-packed full with material okay i graduate that material up to a bigger tupperware container and i use that smaller tupperware container for something else that i don't have a lot of and as you just you just buy more tupperware containers and that's how i stay organized with all my materials i we both know the mad scientist i bought four <clears throat> packs with three per pack of the loon loops. And I sat here and hole punched every one of his materials. <laughs> and I have those hanging up because I have so much of his stuff. And so I have all my scuds on one. I have all my Congo hair on one. I have all my big game hair on another. And that's the only way I can try to stay organized. But yeah, it was the pedestal partner yeah. that I was looking at. I think that's, because, like I said, my I acquired a big piece of granite. I mean, it's huge. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing. I mean, I, I when you're cranking those big, and I've got a. I don't know if you know um, Bernie or not. From no. uh, from uh, was it a Griffin Vices? I got I got a vice. I bought a vice from him. Later, found out that he's mutual friends with the mad scientist with us. Um trying to get him on the show can't do it driving me nuts want him on the show i love i have an odyssey spotter spider vice i love it i had a, a cheap vice when i learned to tie that was the vice i bought for my second one i'm probably gonna buy a mongoose vice in the next month and a half probably but anyway long story short um i'm gonna put it on this big hunk of granite because when i'm tying these big streamers you know that little pedestal is not enough and the pedestal partner is something that i can have no matter how big yeah. that chunk of meat i've got for granted yeah. is and i'm going to go ahead and throw this out there just because it's a shameless plug i have some of these hand tooled um pedestal that you can epoxy there the that's the base. It's the, not the base. The base will be granite. Um, I have some three by fours and some four by four pieces of granite that I'm acquiring. And I have some of these, uh, stainless steel, um, the, the, that your vice will go into to make this a full pedestal vice that we will be selling shortly. Um, so a quick plug for me, uh, I'll be putting them on our, uh, kayak flyer, facebook and instagram but that's just a shameless plug for me but those would go the four by four would go great with some of your stuff too i gotta put in a plug for doug to oh so you're not supposed oh, to say his name when, you're not supposed to say his name the mad what? scientist you can't say his name oh i'm sorry the mad scientist yeah you can't say his real name uh, anyway he uh he did my website he built my website of uh, oasis fly time benches and it's the same website that he built 30 years ago. And he said, now I had it upgraded here a few years ago. So it's a secure website because I was finding that um, it was unsecure and I was being told that, you know, people aren't going to go on your website if it's not secure. So yeah. I paid to have that all done. And we, we put it on another, on WordPress. I had a guy re retake the, but I wanted to keep that same site. I didn't want him yeah. to change it. And so Doug built that for me when he was, he was doing, you know, fly time materials before he built my website. He got out of doing that for a few years to do web design, but he said he got tired of not getting paid for his work. So he got back into the fly time materials. Thank God for all of us. And uh, yes. he's, he's a sharp cookie when it comes to the, the internet and how it all works. And, he is. And, you know, I don't want to steal time from you to talk about the mad scientist, but man, is he a cool guy? Yeah. You know, I can call him on the phone and we will sit and talk. And he's like, well, when do you want to do this? When do you want to do that? And he's like, Hey, I've got some hooks and his hooks are out on the market now. I got him. He, yeah. 
Yeah. He called me on the phone. He's like, Hey, will you test these? And I'm like, what do you want me to do? He goes, hammer them into a piece of wood and try and break them. Oh. And I did. I, I hammered it into a piece of firewood three times, pulled it out and thumped my finger with this hook thinking it's going to be dull. And I drew blood and mm. the, the fly tires, dungeon hooks, amazing. The fish joints and the fish shanks. I tie so many big articulated flies on those. And then everything else, the big game hair, the Congo hair, the water silk, the Northern lights, I don't, I don't think I tie a single fly anymore that does not have at least two of his materials in them. No, he's so such a creative person. That's where yeah. his strength is, his, his creativity. Yep. Yeah. And it's it's really great because he told me about you, and I, I thought I dialed your number right, and I left a message, and then I emailed you, and you're like, no, I didn't get your message. And then yeah. all of a sudden yeah. we're – we're here together, and uh, unfortunately, our, our original scheduled guest tonight had a uh, problem, and, and we our thoughts and prayers are with him, um, but being able to have you on tonight was just such a treat. Um, tell everybody where they can find all of your information at. Well, at oasisbenches.com is my website, and uh, I still sell to Feathercraft. When I, when I left the big box stores in 2008. Feathercraft and in St. Louis? Feathercraft carries my stuff. In fact, I just got a big order for them from them today. Are they, they, don't is, carry, they don't carry my big benches and stuff. Is <laughs> Feathercraft they, they a chain? Stuff. What's that? Is Feathercraft a chain? No. No, it's one store. It's just the St. Louis store. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've been there. I, I go there all the time. About, when I first started my business 30 years ago and I was getting out of teaching and um, I needed money uh, to buy materials and to pay employees back then when I was doing it full time. And a friend of mine that works at a bank said, well, why don't you ask them, see if they'll loan you some money. So I asked Bob Story at Feathercraft, who mm -hmm. I didn't realize he was, he was as young as he was back then. But, um, <laughs> hey, Bob, I really want to do these benches, but um, can you, um, I said, can I borrow $5,000 from you? Can you loan me, spot me five grand? And I'll just pay you back in product. He said, sure. Yeah. So I have always remembered that. And so I am still selling to Feathercraft because of what he did to me when I was first starting. Well, that's funny because Feathercraft is my closest fly shop. Yeah. 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 And mm -hmm. it's, and they're good people. I like the guys at Hargroves too. Um, Feathercraft, you go in and it's very professional. Hargroves, you walk in with a six pack of beer. Oh. They're, they're total opposites. Feathercraft is a very organized, nice fly shop. Hargroves is a house that mm -hmm. has been flipped into a fly shop. Both of them, if you're in St. Louis, both of them are great. But yeah, Feathercraft is, now, is where you're going to see. Now, Mad um, have you been to their new shop? Yep, Mad River, yeah. Yep, I've he watched got, their stuff on them. He got, he got me a big, big order last fall. I was about to drop my jaw when I... What's it, you know, he usually, you know, he's been buying from me for years, but they're just small, hundred, two, three hundred dollar orders. And he sends me this huge order. He said, "Well, we're moving our shop. Our business is doing great. I really want to start carrying your stuff." So they've got a bunch of my stuff. And um, Jay Stockard in, mm -hmm. in New England, he's carrying my stuff. But that's those are the only. And I used to sell um, real swag in an order from the fly shop in Redding, California, for my fly factory. But that's about all they buy. Um, and, but some of the stop shops aren't selling the big, and I am limited with my time, especially with this other business of mine. I get really busy in the spring and summer, and I just can't keep up with inventory like I probably should be able to. If so, you don't mind, I would like to share this to my friend Nick Dooley at Dooley's Fly Fishing. Say 15% on all orders at Dooley Fly Fishing, promo code kayak. But I've got to work that in. Yeah. You see how I did? So I'm a pro. I used to be an old an old radio DJ, but I think that might be a good fit too for you. And he may not be. He's opening a brick and mortar now, but he's an online place. But at least we can advertise your stuff through him. Yeah, I'm I'm really not looking to expand wholesale wise. <laughs> Thanks you know, for just totally pooping on everything I just said when I did a nice I'm promo. <laughs> so, I mean, my website. I, uh, that's uh, definitely most of my sales. These are on my website. But I still sell to these big box, these uh, Feathercraft, 
Stockard, Mad River Outfitters, and that's right. about all I'm going to handle. I, I just don't want to get to the point where I don't have inventory with the feather caps. Get, and, and this order I got today, there's a couple things I'm out of. And well, have I'm, you, have we're you starting found that? Today. Hmm? With the pandemic, have you found that you're running out of stuff? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, this has been a, a better than average year for both my businesses. Yeah. yeah, I think for the water harvesting, because people are sitting around home, what can we do to improve our house? And, well, let's do rainwater harvesting, you know, and, and so they'll, I, I've had a, I had a wonder, un, unbelievably good year last year. And, yeah, and I, benches, benches are doing, are doing a lot better this year. I talked to, and uh, uh, I mean, you know this, I mean, we, we talk to people all the time and, and we talk, try to talk to industry people because I've always said you don't buy a product based on the product unless you know the person, you know, I, I bought stuff before and then I've met somebody and I've been like, I'm not going to spend my money with them. Or I've not bought something before and then I've met the person and be like, I'm going to give them my business, you know, and you know, a, a lot of guys out there are, are like that. I mean, you want to get to yeah. know the person you're dealing yeah, sure. with. Sure. And I think that goes a really long way. But everybody that I've talked to this year, uh, River Road Creations, the Mad Scientist, I mean, everybody, the fly tying industry has boomed. Yeah. And now in 20, in the fall of 2021, are we going to see a massive sell off of used vices and tools and kayaks and fly rods? I don't think so. You know, you know, when, I hope when the movie not. River runs coat river runs through it came out. Yeah. Oh, you know, all, everybody wanted to get into fly fishing. Yeah. And that's the years I was working up at blue ribbon in West Yellowstone. And they were having great, great years. And uh, in fact, I was the year they filmed it. I was up there when they were filming it up that that year. Um, but yeah, it, it. And but then what really hit the economy, I think, would hurt. Um, as I used to sell the two hundred fly shops uh, when I first started, I had a mailing list of two hundred fly shops in the United States. And when I first started selling the Bass Pro Shop, they had four stores. And when I left Bass Pro Shop, they had 50 stores. Yeah. So I went through that growth with them and I, I gave them a very nice display unit that made that held like six of the different benches that really made them shine. God, they would I would get a, a, they were my little pedestal base bench, which uh, I've sold over 12,000 of those benches since I started. They would buy them a gross or two gross at a time from me every mm -hmm. month. And they just, this was just crazy back in, back in those days. I had three or four people working for me, all part-time people working 20, 30 hours a week. But, but we had, I was doing 3,000 benches a year uh, back in those days. Um, now, I can't do that right now. And, and with the water harvesting business, I don't want to do that. Uh, right. I, I tell you, the benches is nice, but I make a lot better money selling $2,000 water tanks. Then I do a two hundred dollar uh, bench. Yeah. So I mean, it's just the economics of it. I just I love making the benches. I, I think they're good quality. Maybe someday I can sell the business to somebody that has the passion that I do with the woodworking, and we can keep this line going. But um, it, 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 we'll just wait and see. But so I'm hoping one... this, this podcast. I want to say this has been great talking with you. My first time doing a podcast. Uh, I'm a little I'm a little nervous about what it could do. <laughs> but I well, know there are guys that make recurve bows. That it's a six month waiting list. I was talking to a friend of mine that's a bow letter, and he wants to get one of these bows. He said, "But I have to wait six months before I can get it." Um, that's what it takes. That I would just have to hire a couple more people. Well, the nineteen listeners we have will all buy something from okay. you. I can retire so, now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, real quick, a woodworker. How many fingers do you have? You've got 10. And they all <laughs> work. Not, I never trust a shop teacher with 10 fingers. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to be on point all the time. People do stupid things working around power tools. Oh, don't they, though? Yeah. My Lord. Rick, this has been amazing. I appreciate you coming on the show. I'm so thankful that our friend got us together. 
Um, this has just been great, man. This has been great. And I'm going to have to get with you and I'm going to have to get that pedestal partner so that I, uh, don't have to have 16 pairs of scissors in order to find one pair because I've lost them on my desk. (laughs) Yeah. We'll get you up there. All right, guys, this is, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Hey, you're welcome back anytime you want to come back. Sure. We'll That's get Adam a, on next time. We have a threesome. Oh, we can't. Oh. We can we, we can do that. We can even get uh, the mad scientist on and have a foursome. Yeah, there you go. And uh, and, um, and and I want to put in a plug for that link again. Yes, that, go ahead. The, the native spe- the native trout species uh, of Arizona for the Gila trout and Apache trout that Zach Beards his program he did for our club. So I'll give I'll send you that link. And then you use it however you want to use it. I will put that link in the show notes for the podcast and they will be in the notes for the YouTube. So you can go immediately after this show and you can check that out guys. And I'll also put it on the kayak flyer Facebook and Hey, before we get away, you tell us, you tell us, and we're trying to grow our YouTube. You tell us what your favorite part of this conversation was on YouTube. And I will mail you a free Cutthroat Furled Leader from CutthroatFurledLeaders.com. Save 15% on your order when you use promo kayak at CutthroatFurledLeaders.com. Guys, this is Sean. I've been not Rick was here. Adam had some trouble. We want to go ahead and say thanks to Adam. Latrell's Fly Fishing, or Latrell's Fly Shop is what it is. Instagram and on Etsy. We want to say thank you for all you guys listening at We will be back here next week, and mm, big news, big news, Drew Gregory is recording this month. He will be out in April.